I'm one of the director of studies uh, in classics in Corpus. Um, I wanted to say, first off, this is my first time doing a webinar. Um, I'm obviously used to doing Zoom things, um, but it's really quite weird. I'm basically talking to my computer. Um, and so I was just quite keen to hear a bit from you before I even get started. Um, so um, this is partly to get you used to the Q&A uh, functionality as well. Um, because uh, I'm, as Naomi said, I'm going to be asking you to kind of interact with the talk I'm going to give. So I wondered if you could just start, find the Q&A button and enter into the Q&A, just maybe a name and where you are. I'm just kind of interested to see the range of places that we've got people in today. Um, obviously, this would usually be, we would be in the Macron Lecture Theatre uh, in, in Corpus. Um, and you can see behind me, maybe um, the, the background, that's Old Court. It's one of my favourite, uh, yeah, it's definitely my favourite court in uh, uh, corpus so brilliant um, you're finding the q a box so lancashire cardiff uh, Sussex, Stamford, Kent, we're all over the place, East Lothian, Abu Dhabi, amazing, um, brilliant, so great to see so many, and um, um, th th that is one of the advantages, isn't it, that we can have people uh, uh, globally joining us too, so welcome to everybody, and thanks for joining in. So I'm going to be talking um, the idea really of these masterclasses is to give you a, a flavour of what the classics degree in, in, at Cambridge involves. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you on the topic of trees and waves, understanding language change. Um, and I realise that this may not feel like it's part of the core um, of the classics kind of subject um, and it's probably quite different um, from what those of you who are studying Latin or Greek or classical civilization at school. Um, and it's true that the classics degree at Cambridge has lots of elements which are more like those subjects that you study at school. Um, but it's also true that the classics degree at Cambridge is, is heavily language based. Um, so a talk about language seemed perfectly um, reflective of what the course is about. And in fact, I'm, I'm really proud to be part of a linguistics department within the classics faculty that has several academic hard hitters like our current professor James Claxon and our former professor Jeff Horrocks. And I'll, I'll be mentioning various of their books as we go. Um, so I'm just scrolling through the Q&A now. Uh, so thanks so much for all of you. A, a great range of places there. So I'm going to try and get to the bottom of that Q&A so I can see things coming up. Um, I will leave questions um, more general. So I will leave time for more general questions at the end. But like I say, I will be um, uh, asking you to kind of uh, interact as I'm talking too. So I'm now going to share my screen uh, so that we can talk on this understanding language change and I'm sharing my sound too. So I hope you can all see that. Um, I've now lost the Q&A section, but I can bring it back. Great. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about change. Um, uh, in language, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, particular models of that. So there are um, ways to explain that, and we can use models of, of trees and waves. Um, but before I talk about those models, then I need to talk about language change in general. Uh, and I think it's important to start with the idea that, that they ha this is something that has always happened, right? Um, uh, we know this because people have always complained about it. Um, so it, it, even in uh, early Latin texts, we find people saying the, the youth of today, they're not speaking properly. Um, now, there are lots of reasons for why this change might happen. Um, so one of the reasons is that there might be a new concept that comes into the language that just needs a new word, right? Um, then there's different contact with other languages, um, and that will affect the kind of first language in various different ways. Um, then there's a desire to be different, and there's also politics. Okay, so um, I hope everybody is seeing the screen, the the shield, the the the, the um, uh, slides. Okay, and uh, it seems like um, well, nobody's telling me otherwise. So I will assume that's the case. Um, so I, I just wanted to start with a, a nice picture of Cicero here and uh, um, just proof that that, that uh, people always complained, right? So I myself knew that our ancestors didn't employ the aspirate except before a vowel. So I used to carefully say pulke, no evidence of a ha huh there. But after some time, I gave way to the people in the way of speech and kept my learning to myself. And um, so the 
idea is that he would have, I guess, pronounced some kind of huh in pulke. That's interesting in various different ways, but um, the main thing I want to point out here is that um, uh, 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 Latin speakers were commenting on the fact that their language was changing before their very eyes. So there's various different types of change that we can talk about, and I will be giving some examples of all of them. Um, so sound change is maybe uh, the one that we're most aware of. Um, there's also semantic change, where the meaning of words change over time. And then syntactic change, where the structure of the language, the grammar can change over time too. Um, uh, but um, I thought that it would be the best way of kind of uh, talking about these different changes um, for you to see some of them in, in action yourself. Um, and I should have said beforehand that I'm not assuming any uh, prior knowledge of either Latin or Greek or in fact any other language um, other than English. I do assume that you can follow along with English. And therefore, I've got um, uh, some old English to compare with modern English. Um, so I've got a passage from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. This you may be aware of this text. Um, it's about 600 years old. So by comparing it to the translation, we can see some of the changes happening. So I'm going to play a recording of it. I hope this works. Um, and um, I, what I'd like you to do is just watch and listen um, to see what changes you're aware of. Um, uh, so I guess I'm thinking of those three different types I mentioned, the sound change, uh, semantic change and syntactic change. I have highlighted some of the words that I'll talk about later, um, but obviously if there are other words that you're noticing too, then do listen out. And so this is the chance for you to uh, get involved. So do um, shout out when you're noticing things that are uh, interesting, okay? So let me start it off. One rappel with his sure as sorter the drooked of March hath pursed to the rotor, and bathed every vine in switch liqueur of which vertu engendered is the flour. One Zephyrus ache with his sway to breath, in spirit hath in every hort and hath the tender acropis, and the young sunna hath in the ram his halva coursi runner, and smaller foolish mark in melodia, that sleep in all the nicht with open ear, so pricketh the nature in her barrages. Then long and fork to go on, on pilgrimages, and palmers for to say can stranger, stranger to fair na halvers. Okay, um, so I don't know if any of you have heard um, Chaucer being read in that kind of authentic uh, way before, um, but um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and I wonder whether you did notice uh, any of the uh, changes that I talked about. So feel free to enter them into the Q&A. Like I say, I've highlighted uh, some of the words. Um, so interested to see if you notice them yet. Yeah, great. So different sentence structure, different E sound, sound change of O, yet yeah, sound, sweet, sort of, yeah, the sentence structure is different. Yeah, fluor. Um, interesting, yeah, it sounds very Germanic compared to English now, yeah. Vowels have shifted, brilliant. Yeah, different pronunciation of pilgrimages. Um, I, it, it, to me, it sounded much uh, French, more French than uh, English, right? They roll their R's, yeah, very good. Brilliant, well done. Um, so um, the ones that I um, pointed out were various examples, right? So Juan at the beginning I highlighted, and we could hear the H the H sound in that. Um, and then in Drochte, we could finally understand why uh, we spell English in the crazy way that we do maybe right um then um in some of the syntactic uh change and then the word order that's um coming out as well um in terms of the semantic change i was interested in line nine there the smaller foul as muck and melody um anybody got idea ah yes esme um in fact mentioned that point just now the foulest and birds exactly so so foul um as in um uh, fish and fowl right uh, and we have foul as a part of, of a, a word right um so um uh, that was an example of of a semantic change where um now foul is a smaller um uh, a, a narrower version of birds, right? So I thought we'd listen to it one more time. One rappel with his sure as sorter, 
the drucht of March hath pursed to the rota, and bathed every vine in switch liqueur, of which vertu engendered is the flour. Juan Zephyrus ache with his sway to breath, in spirit hath in every hort and hath the tender acropis, and the young sonna hath in the ram his halva cursi runna, and smaller foolis marken the melodia, that sleep in all the nicht with open ear, so pricketh them nature in her parages. Then long and fork to go on, on pilgrimages, and palmers for to say can stranger, stranger, stupid, and a Great. And um, so it's kind of interesting, right? Um, um, I think it's partly interesting to. Um, to, to hear it rather than just see it on the page and you can then get a feeling for just how different it is. Maybe when you read it, it, it looks um, more, more different. Um, I think as lots of people have said, it's, it's interesting with uh, when you have other language. Um, so um, the, when one Zephyrus ik with his swear to breath, you might have, have thought of uh, German auch if you uh, know German. Um, quite obviously quite different from also right um so um uh, just seeing the translation um doesn't give you the whole picture you can use your other uh, language um, um background to help out with it uh, and that's definitely the case um with with latin and greek as well and um, so um um by by learning the one it helps with the other and and the more languages you know the better right um so i'm really pleased that um got various uh, interesting uh, comments on that um, so I am going to leave um, the Chaucer behind now and move on to some specific examples. So to, to kind of explain some of those changes that we saw. So um, looking at sound change first, um, one of the kind of early uh, recognitions of, of, of uh, uh, sound changes happening regularly um, was, was drawn up by the Brothers Grimm. Um, and there's a picture of uh, them on your slide there. Um, and um, these, we may know the Brothers Grimm from, from stories, right? Um, but it's maybe not as well known that they were uh, serious linguists and they were observing the kinds of changes that I was talking about now. Um, so this was done by comparing um, words from related languages and noticing that there were many similarities, similarities, but some differences too. So taking the word for foot, we could see that Greek Pus, Latin pes, Sanskrit pada, and Lithuan Lithuanian peda. Um, uh, by this, by the time of the Brothers Grimm, we'd seen that there was a relationship between these languages. They were Indo-European languages, as we say, um, and so we knew that there was a good deal of uh, relation between them. Um, but the weird thing was that English in some ways was similar, but uh, was different in some ways. So in English, rather than starting with a P, uh, we have foot, and uh, German too has first Danish foot and Norwegian and S Swedish foot. Apologies for my pr uh, pronunciation of Danish and, and Norwegian. Um, they're, they're, my Scandinavian languages are not up to scratch. But anyway, the general rule here is that in the Germanic languages, we can see that there is a change from P to F, as it were, a change from P to F. And what was particularly interesting for the Brothers Grimm was that um, it wasn't just an isolated change. Um, with the English word third, this seems to be related to Greek tritos, Latin tertius, Sanskrit treta, Lithuanian tresias. But English had third, and this was um, mirrored in other Germanic languages. So we have Old Frisian threda, Old Saxon thridia, and Gothic thridia, and Icelandic thridii. So there we have a change of t, t, th. Um, and then another comparison, we have the English word dog. In the non-Germanic languages in the Indo-European family, we have a cuss sound in kjorn and carnis and ki. Sorry, Welsh speakers. Um, but in English, we have hound and Dutch hond, German hund and Danish, Norwegian and Swedish hunt too. So we seem to have a change from a k sound to a h sound. What was particularly interesting here is that um, these share similarities, these sounds, right? So they're all stops, p, t, k, uh, and they've all changed uh, in a similar way. Um, so what um, Grimm's law states is that um, sound change occurs regularly when the environment is the same and similar sounds are affected in similar ways. Sounds seem to affect other sounds, so we can get a cycle of sound changes. 
And that change can be explained, even though we don't necessarily predict it, um, but we can explain why a particular change would have happened. Okay, so that's the first type of change I wanted to talk about. Um, moving on to semantic change then, which we also saw in the uh, Chaucer passage. Um, so um, I mentioned that languages change because new concepts arise, and that's certainly the case in these uh, words that I'm going to mention um, now. Um, I should have mentioned, by the way, at the beginning, I have a handout to share with you. I'll, I'll put it into the Q&A in a minute. Um, uh, it's, you don't need it, clearly. Um, you can follow along with the slides, but um, the handout will have some of these examples um, for you to refer back to if you're interested to later. So um, the uh, additional words that we find in Latin, and um, this is the interesting case that, that Latin, uh, you know, is an ancient language. It's a dead language, as people will sometimes tell me, why are you studying a dead language? It's actually very much alive. Um, until very recently, um, there was a Finnish radio station broadcasting the news in Latin, um, and Latin is still a spoken language in the Vatican. Um, and um, uh, obviously, um, um, in classical Latin, there were there weren't the words for some concepts that need to be talked about in the Vatican today. So every year, there's a, a an updated word list where the kind of um, authorized words are, are um, uh, given. So we have the word for bicycle, birota, the word for a cigarette, a fistula nicotiana, um, a word for shampoo, captilavium, a uh, word for terrorist a word for miniskirt and a word for hot pants. Um, so various um, new concepts that needed to have new words kind of invented for them. Um, now we can see a similar process, even if it's not um, published in a, in a uh, official word list, we can see similar things going on in English. So we can see um, English orange, uh, which comes from Spanish naranja. Uh, it's uh, an interesting one, um, um, which I, I might have time to go into later. Um, then um, it's not just uh, close languages. We uh, have uh, anorak from Greenlandic, a geometry from Greek, uh, tax from Old French, city from Old French, and they from Norse. Obviously, the, 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 the reasons that we get these words in our language from other languages is a particularly interesting uh, feature, right? And um, English is a real magpie in this respect. Um, and actually, in some ways, the most interesting one there is the fact that we have they from Norse. They is, is a pronoun which um, is seen to be the most kind of um, resistant to change. Um, so it's the most likely to be native, but English is, is so much of a magpie that it's even borrowed its pronouns from other languages. Now, um, there are ways that we can describe this change, obviously, and there's um, linguists have come up with um, terms to use to, to kind of categorize the different changes that we see. So one of these changes um, is amelioration. So this is moving on from just completely new words being added for new concepts, but even original words can change over time. So um, words can um, uh, um, become kind of quality, you know, their quality can change, they can become better words. So the word pretty turns up in Old English, but there it has a rather negative meaning, tricky or sly, whereas in, 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 in modern English, it's, it's normally a reasonably positive word, right? Um, Similarly, uh, uh, our word nice um, in Middle English meant foolish or stupid. And there is, in fact, the exact opposite of this. So words can develop from a good meaning to a bad meaning. So our, uh, the Old English knafa um, meant boy, kind of neutral young male uh, person, right? Um, but that it gives us our knave, um, now mostly used in a rather negative uh, way. Similarly, mistress, um, we still have the original uh, sense of the head of household. Um, uh, um, in fact, um, uh, another college in Cambridge has a mistress rather than a master, right? Um, but it can also have the more negative connotation of a woman in an extra marital relationship. And then a final type of semantic change is metonymy, where a word changes. This is sometimes um, um, through a kind of part-whole relationship. Um, so our word for a bureau 
um, um, now being used as an office, um, originally meant some rough cloth placed on a working table. Um, so it was a, a type of wool, um, which then got uh, uh, changed be because then the table that had that wool on it uh, was called the burella, and then it changed to, to office. Um, and then the final example of this is a pen, um, which originally meant feather. Um, so if you understand uh, the history of pens, you can kind of um, uh, understand uh, this, this development, right? So we saw it develop from the bird's feather to the quill to a general metal tool uh, um, for writing. And it's even then developed into a writer, right? So we can talk about somebody being a witty pen. So the word feather has, has developed really quite a long way in its development. Now, again, um, just as with sound change, uh, we can um, explain and um, draw up kind of uh, the patterns and the laws that we see of, of what happens in this kind of change. So we've seen that words can be added to a language, uh, which might show a contact situation and suggests that new concepts have entered the world. And we can also see that words can change meaning over time. Um, but it's important to say that, again, this change can be described, but not predicted. Um, so you wouldn't have said that a word for feather um, would eventually be used to describe a, a, a writer. Um, but once that change has happened, you can explain why and point to um, similar examples. So the final kind of change I wanted to talk about is maybe the most um, obscure, um, it's um, syntactic change. Um, and as an example, again, I wanted to start with a language which we're all familiar with. Um, so I wanted to look at um, grammaticalization where um, words that are used with more of a, um, more as meaning words take on more grammatical word, uh, uh, grammatical senses. So this isn't very clear. Hopefully the examples will clear it up. So uh, we all know the verb go and we use it often. And uh, normally that has a, a full sense of, of motion, right? So I'm going to London and uh, we are kind of understanding the, the motion in that um, use of go. But we also use it as what we might say is a, a future tense marker, right? I'm going to eat lunch soon, could be used as a translation um, for a future tense in another language. And it's clearly, there is no motion. I mean, I guess I am gonna move from this particular um, location to my kitchen, but um, that's not really what um, it seems to be going on here. So the motion word, uh, a kind of um, a, a meaningful word has developed to a grammatical marker. And it's not, it's not just, I can tell you that that is the case. We can see some differences between these two verbs, these two uses of the verbs. Um, so in um, the future tense marker, we can have a change of pronunciation and that typically is a reduction. So um, even if we wouldn't write it, um, we do say, I'm gonna eat lunch soon. Right. So the original going to has reduced to just two syllables gonna. We can't do that reduction, that form of it, when we are still using going to in the um, original sentence, I'm going to London. We, we can't sensibly say I'm gonna London. Um, I mean, I guess we could just about make that sentence work, but it wouldn't mean I'm going to London, right, in the normal sense of that. Um, so this isn't just a sound change. This isn't just a, a reduction that always happens of those consonants when they're next to each other or something like that. This is a, a change that is caused by it becoming a, more of a grammatical word and then losing its um, phonetic um, kind of uh, size. Okay. So just to give you another example of, 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 of syntactic ch change, um, this is a place where I was again keen to see some interaction. Uh, so get ready with your Q&A boxes again, if that's moved away. Um, so what I wanted to see um, was the answer to my question. What does the word pas in French mean? Not, 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 not brilliant. Now I am seeing uh, some few people, uh, some people who do know the kind of catch you out uh, uh, answer here, which is that pa originally meant step. 
So just to take it back in case there are people that don't know um, French, then um, uh, in French, the normal way of um, negating a sentence, so j'aime, I like, and je n'aime pas, I don't like, right? Um, so um, for French speakers, the pa feel very strongly negative. Um, and we can see this particularly when um, we, um, um, when uh, we, we don't even say the n bit of it. So j'aime pas is the standard way of, of, of um, saying I don't like um, in, uh, in colloquial French. I've just seen a really nice um, uh, addition from Priya here, pas de deux in, in ballet. Yes, it's a step of two. So how does a word which originally meant step then come to be a, a, a negator, not. It seems something really quite uh, strange. Um, so um, there is a comparison to be made here, sorry, um, which is that pas isn't the only negative word in French, right? Um, so you can say je n'aime point, I don't like at all. Um, je ne mange me, I won't eat a further morsel. And uh, je ne bois goutte, I won't drink another drop. Um, these haven't come as, uh, they, they, they're not as standard a way of negating, but in particular contexts, um, they are used essentially as, as negative markers. So um, we can see what's happened here um, by looking at the history. So in Old French, the only way of doing negation was just to have the ne, je ne dis, would be the Old French of saying, I don't say. Um, but at some stage, um, this wasn't felt to be strong enough, basically. Um, so you can see that the ne is, is, a, is a small little word and um, it, it anyway was a, um, a, a, an environment where extra words could be used to support it. And so in Old French and Middle French, we'd see various different um, secondary elements. So je ne dis pas. Parole, I don't say a word, and je ne mange me, I'm not eating a crumb. Uh, and as we've seen, je, je ne, uh, um, uh, uh, il ne va pas, he's not going a, a step, right? Um, and eventually that um, pas became uh, generally associated with negation, so now it's the standard to have both of them. What's then interesting is that the original pre-verbal element of ne becomes optional or is lost altogether. So just as I said, j'aime pas, we've got here je dis pas. So in modern colloquial French, we've lost the original negator. So as we saw with the sound change, there's some uh, cycles going on. There are um, changes um, that affect each other over time. Okay. So um, I'm going to move on to um, talk then about really the, 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 the uh, uh, title of my talk, which is um, about uh, trees and waves. Um, and I am keen to leave some time at the end for uh, questions. So I'm going to move relatively quickly through this. Um, but um, there will be time, as I say, for you to um, take me back and ask anything about these um, slides. So. Um, in explaining uh, the types of changes that we've seen, um, one of the first models that was uh, used uh, was a, a tree model. And so I've put on one of the early um, family trees that was drawn up to uh, describe the relationships between Indo-European and the various uh, um, um, uh, languages in that family. So, in the family of Indo-European, where we find Greek and Latin, uh, we can put Greek and Latin um, as the daughter languages uh, to a proposed parent. Um, so it's it's a postulated parent. We don't have direct evidence for it. So we talk about Proto-Indo-European when we're talking about that parent language, and we can reconstruct it on the basis of looking at the comparing the forms that we find in the various daughter. Um, languages. And based on their relationships and, and similarities, um, Schleicher uh, was able to draw up this tree, which showed that um, various of the languages, although all Indo-European, had closer or, or, or not so close relationships with each other. So the family tree involved various kind of sub-branches. I guess what's particularly interesting in Indo-European is just how broad a spread it has. So it is Indo-European, the Indian languages and the European languages. Um, Indic and Iranian are um, on their own branch and they are separate from Greek, Celtic, Latin, and they are then separate from the Germanic languages of which English is one. 
Um, so this idea of a family tree is, of course, an analogy from biology, and it's um, interesting that the, the trees to describe the languages were being um, developed at the same time that trees were being used to explain other kinds of relationships um, in biology too. So on the next slide, I wanted to show you a rather more kind of developed um, slide of the relationships between the different languages. And I don't expect you to um, kind of um, take all of this in, um, but I just thought you might like to see that then the development into the daughter languages too. And an even more complicated one here and um, that's looking even more scientific right and quite a few uh, people when they first do their first linguistics essay in in uh, in classics say they were surprised by how scientific it is and um, yes classics is a is an art subject and um, but there's there's lots of science there's lots of theory in, in all of the various different um uh, elements of the course and um, but maybe particularly linguistics um, but there have been more artistic representations of these relationships too. So I like this uh, version of uh, a tree that shows the rather uh, complicated um, movements of, of branches um, developing into each other. And this is my favorite of all. Um, it's just a beautiful image, I think. Um, and uh, it's um, comparing it, by the way, um, also to Uralic. Um, so the interesting family tree where we find Finnish and Hungarian somehow on the same tree, which is a, another controversial and, and difficult question. Um, but looking particularly at the Indo-European part of it, we can see um, uh, the, the different um, sizes of the different languages and the, the, the different relationships a bit um, more um, interestingly. So um, it would seem then that, that a tree model can be quite good to describe um, the relationship that we see between these uh, various different languages and it's certainly um, uh, something that's useful to, to visualize the uh, relationship between them. But the difficulty is that um, it, it suggests a type of change which isn't well matched um, by what we see when we see languages actually changing. Okay, so um, a different model has been proposed to explain that, um, which is known as the wave model. So let me see if I can bring that up. Yeah, so this is partly because um, we see that um, change is gradual and not abrupt. So it's not as if um, um, speakers of, of, of Greek saying pus um, uh, suddenly woke up one day in Germany and started saying fus or foot instead, right? Instead, there is a, a, this gradual change over time. Um, we've also seen by studying uh, languages in action that it doesn't affect all words at the same time. So although Grimm talked about all P's changing to F's, as it were, all P's changing to F's, um, uh, and, and although we can say that historically, when we look at um, languages as they're lived and, and spoken in the moment, um, we can see that not all of the examples of a P sound would change to F at the same time. Um, what's been particularly interesting is seeing how change affects different speaker populations at different times, and this is a branch of linguistics known as sociolinguistics. Sorry, there was one final point I wanted to make there. So yes, that changes do not always complete. So um, again, although the Grimm's said that all pers would change to fuzz, in fact, we've seen some examples in, in uh, change in action where some relics have remained of a previous stage of the language. So this gives us some kind of problems um, with talking, with saying whether the tree model or the wave model is better. So what we can see is that the tree model suggests that there are nice clean splits between the different languages, um, but there are some problems. So distinguishing between a language and a dialect just isn't clear. Um, if anybody knows um, the languages and dialects spoken in, in, in France, for example, we can see dialects that are mutually intelligible with Italian and dialects that are mutually intelligible with Spanish. And yet some of them are described as French dialects and some of them described as Italian dialects. Um, and that seems to be a political decision rather than a, 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 a kind of scientific decision. It's also difficult to say when a new language has been born. So this idea that there are Germanic languages that have then split into German and English say, well, at what stage did English really become English and separate from uh, German? 
So I'd like to conclude on a kind of um, conciliatory note, really, and suggest that uh, maybe the uh, different models are useful um, uh, and both true in some ways at representing um, what we have, but they're trying to represent different things. So we can use maybe the tree model historically to look back how uh, languages have um, uh, are related to each other now, but when we're talking about how a language is actually changing in the moment, then a wave model might be more accurate. I might point out in that in my favourite picture of the tree and um, that it's not as kind of clean cut a, a, a model uh, as the original diagrams kind of family trees are. Um, and so here we can think that, well, you know, trees too and the branches start off as as a shoot. And so um, maybe there is more to the tree model than we might have originally thought. So that's all I wanted to say on um the topic to give you some time for some questions i've put some um some of the uh, books that i've referred to um in during the talk on my final slide and um, along with some others that you might want to if there's been something that's interested you there then you can follow up in those books so i'm going to stop sharing the screen and that will then enable me to um see the Q&A more easily. Um, I'm going to put in the um, link to my uh, to the handout that I mentioned while you gather your thoughts. So I'm seeing some interesting questions here. Would French be a dialect or a language? What are your thoughts on gendered language? Where does Arabic lie on the linguistics tree? How do you think literature impacted on the evolution of language? Wow, such great questions. Um, so I'm just gonna um, make uh, send across this a handout for you. So obviously, um, I'm not going to have time to answer all of them. There's, there's such interesting um, questions. So I'm going to start with this one. Which model of change diagram do you believe is most beneficial to teach classical students today? I guess that's the one um, that then um, could l help me talk a bit about classics. And um, I think the, the the tree model is useful um, partly because it, it's uh, interesting in the history of the subject, right? So it is um, um, interesting thinking that linguistics isn't the core of class. Classics. Um, I do think that classics is at the core of linguistics, right? So linguistics started from classicists and um, it was people with knowledge of Latin and Greek that then learned Sanskrit that saw the relationships between them. Um, so a tree model is definitely kind of useful historically. Um, and certainly having an awareness of that tree um, of the, uh, the Indo-European languages helps, I think, when learning Latin and Greek to see that they come from the same trunk and so you can apply things that you know from one language to the other. So are new languages still being created now? Yes, very uh, interesting question. Um, that's from Luke Taylor, thank you. Um, and um, uh, I saw another question earlier on, which was about the Creole. So I guess those are the uh, languages that um, are most kind of obviously new creations, right? So Creoles, um, the term that's used um, for, for languages that were created actually mostly originally in, in the context of slavery, where there were lots of people from lots of different linguistic backgrounds, and they were developed first in a kind of pidgin, a rather basic um, a language just used to um, kind of communicate with uh, with each other and um, but then children that were exposed to that pigeon developed that language essentially and it became more like a, a fully fledged language at which stage and um, then known as creoles um, and they've got really interesting uh, mixtures of the original uh, languages and then the the kind of organic uh, developments in terms of whether other new languages are being developed i mean i guess there are these artificial ones like esperanto but i don't know whether they're um uh, that, that they're a, a bit um, well artificial in 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 many ways, um, and, and there's not that many people speaking them. Um, so, in a way, though, languages are becoming a new every day because um, new concepts are being developed, and um, we are all uh, changing as we go. 
All right. So it, lots more interesting questions. Where could Basque be placed on a T diagram? Well, Basque is actually what's known as a linguistic isolate. Um, so we kind of just put it off to the side. And there's um, interesting research being done on, on just um, what happened there. Um, we um, can see interesting things it, when we look at the geographic spread of languages. It's interesting to see, for example, Celtic uh, languages are, are pushed to the edge of Europe, right? So we can see them in Brittany and in um, uh, uh, Ireland and, and Cornwall and so on. Um, so it, it seems like those original Celtic speakers would have originally uh, covered a wider geographical spread, but now they've been pushed to the edges. So I guess Basque is kind of interesting in that respect. Uh, presumably at one time there would have been other linguistic kind of siblings closer by, but we don't have any evidence of those as far as I'm aware. So I promised that I would put the uh, PDF in the um, chat um, and I then discovered that I hadn't actually turned it into a, a PDF. So I'm just doing that as I'm talking. And I know that you've got to um, uh, have a bit of a break before your Q&A with the um, uh, students um, and I do think that um, probably they're going to be the best place to um, answer questions about what the course is like. So I'm just copying the um, link to the paper. Oh, hang on a minute. Sorry, I told you I, this is the first time I've done this one. So. So um, yes, I've, I've got another um, um, question asking about the Finnish and Hungarian. Um, it is it's still controversial. It, it's just that they're so far away. And um, actually when people have studied them even more, um, and when they create the proto language for that um, tree, um, it ends up looking rather much more like one or the other. So um, it is a, a strange um, situation, but um, I don't know um, as much as I would like to on that. So, <laughs> um, some uh, interesting questions that I'm um, trying to just pick up a, a final, um, uh, a couple of other ones. So there was one about literature, wasn't there? Um, uh, and I've, I've seen one related to that. So Rui is asking, how does the written form of languages affect their development? And I think that's a really interesting question. So particularly looking at uh, Greek and um, Latin. Um, and it's obviously a, a difficult point as a classicist because many of the changes that I've talked about, we only understand through really having the recording, for example, of the Chaucer helped, right? But there are ways that we can understand the language even without the recordings. So there's evidence for how Greek and Latin would have sounded, um, partly from what people would say about it at the time, um, partly from the effect of um, certain sounds on neighboring sounds, and um, then partly looking at other languages. So we can see that Latin borrowed Greek words in, um, in particular ways. Um, and so that gives us even more uh, information. So um, just to um, uh, clarify, I've seen one, um, is what you have talked about today similar to the sort of things one would learn about doing classics at Cambridge and would this be an essential module or an optional one? Um, I, uh, uh, an anonymous question there, um, but I do think it's worth reiterating it just uh, as a final point. Um, linguistics is optional, so um, the language is uh, compulsory in the, um, uh, the first two years of the three-year course and the first three years of the four-year course. Um, set texts are compulsory um, throughout, um, uh, but in the final year, um, you get to make up, uh, it's, a, it's a great year, um, you can kind of make your own programme basically with four um, papers that can come from anywhere, and you can also borrow papers from other um, faculties, which does include the linguistics faculty. But in addition to that language work and literature work, there are um, kind of optional um, subjects. So linguistics, history, art and archaeology and philosophy. And of those four, um, uh, students study two in part one, um, but before then um, are given the opportunity to explore them. And so in the first term of the three year course, um, uh, anyway, in Corpus, we encourage you to uh, do an essay in each one of those, and one of those is linguistics. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting, like I said, that um, uh, 
it's kind of quite different to um, what many people think a classics is, but when they come to the uh, lectures, they, they realize that, they're, that we're all linguists, right? Uh, and so there is something of interest. Um, so I hope that you agree um, with this talk too. Um, it is definitely time uh, to go and have a break, um, have a great time uh, with the students. And if anything else comes up, then feel free to email me.